Welcome to the Low Carb USA podcast, where we seek to inspire you to help us build this community. I'm Doug Reynolds. And this is Pam Devine. Hi. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Thanks for being so flexible about last week. <laughs> no, that is, that is not a problem at all. Oh, thanks. And you, you lived here. What brought you to South Africa? I, I grew up there. Well, I, grew, I, I was born in Rhodesia. And, really? Yeah. And um, I moved down to South Africa when I was about 14. <laughs> and I finished high school there and I went to Wits University. And, um, and I worked there until I was about 33. And then I'm, I moved to the States at that point. So um, Amazing. Amazing. Do you ever come back? Do you miss it? I, um, I do. Um, my, my folks were still there for, for a long time. My sister actually left before I did. She went to Australia. Um, uh-huh. But my brother and my parents were there for the longest time. And um, I used to go back all the time to see them. Um, I was also <clears throat> still running comrades. So I was going back. Um, a number of times I wanted to try and get my green number and all of that stuff. So, um, but then my folks moved to Australia to be with my sister and then my brother got involved in a, in a huge shootout in a restaurant, um, in oh. Johannesburg and his kids were there and everything. And he decided, he said, you know, um, if it was just me, I would have just written it off to you. That's like, part of life in South Africa sort of thing. Um, but when it, when it threatened my kids, it was like, you know, suddenly it would, the game changed. And so he went to back, he went to Australia and found, found a job basically and, and moved his family there as well. So my whole nice. family's in Australia. Um, and that's, that's like that big thing, especially in America, everyone always asks if I'm Australian. And, <laughs> yes. and it's like we're not know, good with accents in America. You know that uh, that uh, rivalry between Australia and South Africa with like cricket yes. and all of that. So um, I always say it's like it's not cool to be called to to call a South African and um, uh, an Australian. No, it's like, like no, I never... I'm, going, I'm going to visit my family in Australia, and then everyone's like totally confused. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, yes. um, no, I see it with my New Zealand friends too. Everyone always thinks they're from Australia, and you know yeah, they but, are they butt heads yeah, as well. So they don't appreciate <laughs> yeah. that either. <laughs> yes. No, there's definitely. I mean, the violence is still going on. I actually drove through um, through a riot uh, maybe a month ago. It was very rough over by Auto National Park, but it's pretty isolated. I would say the, the violence and stuff is pretty isolated. You have to be more uh, conscientious here than you do in most parts of the States, but less conscientious than places like Compton. So it, it just depends. You just don't flash things around. Like I don't wear fancy jewelry or <laughs> anything right. you like that. Don't leave shit in your car. Yeah. Um, that was always the thing that amazed me when I came here was like, you know, I had, I, I bought a Jeep Wrangler with a, <clears throat> the soft top so that the roof came off, came down. And I, <clears throat> I went to uh, do some shopping after work one day and literally left my loose briefcase on the back seat, which was, was there. I mean, the, the, top, the roof was down uh, and yes. you could just reach in and grab it. And I, I came back out of the shop and then I saw that it was there and I had a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> but but it was still there in South Africa. There is no way that would have still been there. There's just just no way. No, so. it's true. It's been so hard to get used to because I grew up mostly in Ohio, DC and Ohio. And in Ohio, you leave. There's huge cities in mm-hmm. Ohio, but you still leave your doors and windows open. Right. You don't really lock unless you're fully going out of town. But for the day, you don't lock your doors. Um, you don't worry about blinds being open. So I'm still terrible about that, whether I'm in London or anywhere else, about being vigilant, about locking up and hiding things. Yeah, yeah. well, and like you said, it just becomes just becomes a done thing. That's the, that's just the way it is. And so, um, <laughs> and so you get used to it. And, uh, and I think that's the thing is that people that have left like me, even, um, you know, you decide at some point 
especially when you when you get to experience something different, you know, and then you decide, okay, do I want to continue to live up and with that stress, which you don't even realize is stress, but it is stress. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, do, do is that okay, or do I do I want to settle for something different? Mm -hmm. and that's why a lot of people kind of leave. So tell me, uh, what, what are you doing in South Africa? I mean, I in the right beginning, I actually thought, when, so, so when, um, so Brian Gadet suggested that I, that I contact you, you know, uh, from Captain Soup. And I, the first thing that I thought to myself was, uh, how come he's got a South African uh, director of nutrition? Because, I, you know, the, you had those problems with the rolling blackouts and we had to reschedule this. Yes. Um, so it was like, how come he's got a South African for a, for a director of nutrition? And then, I, <laughs> and then he sent me a couple of clips to listen to you. And I listened to you and I said, she's not South African, so. How, <laughs> no. how no, did actually, you get there? What are you, what quite are you by accident. Doing? So I've been traveling for the last four or five years, studying with traditional cultures all around the globe and see, correlating kind of following in some of the footsteps of Weston A. Price, seeing what's changed since he had written his big book, what stayed the same, what health is really like. And, uh, and that brought me to Tanzania and Uganda earlier this year. And I was in Uganda and I was planning to stay there for uh, at least a month to go up and see some of the tribes up in the northeastern region that are kind of in the war-torn areas. No one talks about them and they're carnivore and they're never brought up. It's always the Maasai and no one else. So, uh, so I wanted to go out to that region and shoot some footage. And while I was there, Museveni was, you know, being elected and, and was elected, but then uh, <laughs> kept shutting off the internet. And Uganda typically has excellent internet. So what I do with traveling is I usually go to places with great internet and then I'll just go see uh, villages and tribes on the weekends. I take long weekends. So I just see clients Monday through Wednesdays. And then I'm in office the other days. And if it's somewhere like maybe Ethiopia, then I take that time off entirely because it's not worth trying to work. The internet's not good enough. Well, when Museveni kept turning it off, I heard from someone uh, two days before I was supposed to be back in office that it was going to be out like this until May. And this was back in February. And so I immediately got online and tried to find a country that didn't require a visa ahead of time in Africa that also had fiber internet. And that was South Africa. So I was like, well, going to South Africa. So I bought a ticket, came here, and within a week, I was completely in love with it. I had this amazing place in Musenberg, which is right on the beach, so I could go swimming every every morning, uh, work out on the beach, and uh, fiber internet was excellent. And I fell so in love with it that I actually bought a place here. So now I have a beach house not too far from there, but we're in the middle of doing everything. So really the blackouts hadn't been a huge issue because there's an app, so I know when they're coming usually. Last week was different. They didn't tell us. Uh, it started to do the load shedding stage like four or what I, I don't fully understand the system, but where they don't give you the warnings. So we were getting these blackouts last minute. So usually I, I could notify people 48 hours ahead of time. But um, but either way, we just put solar in. So we're good there. The only thing is this this town doesn't have fiber yet. So we have 100 megabits. So I bought 100 megabit internet. So it's really good. But if there's storms, then it doesn't work. So I'm not out of the woods yet. <laughs> yes. So um, you're talking about work and, um, and the re <coughs> excuse me. So the reason we're talking here is because um, Brian Gadet from uh, Captain Soup Captain fame Soup. suggested that we talk to you. You're the director of nutrition for, for his organization. Um, yeah. But you said you need good internet. What do you, what, what do you actually oh, what do? do? What, what is work for you? Yeah. <laughs> sure. Great question. I still have, I have several businesses, but I still have my private practice. So I see about 60 people a week for everything from stage four cancer to autism to seizure disorders. I, I genuinely, I generally work with very serious conditions rather than light conditions like weight loss. But I'm focusing heavily now with how much I've traveled on things like diabetes, metabolic syndrome, because there's such a huge issue. And it's such easy, just low hanging fruit to take care of. So I've been doing a lot more of that, but I teach about 41 different diets. I don't work with the high carbohydrate diets uh, at all. I haven't seen them be as effective. And, uh, and I, you know, I met Brian because he and I both healed on a similar 
diet, honestly. So Brian and I were both working out of Eugene. I had a practice in Eugene that was brick and mortar. And then I would travel for conferences and all sorts of things. And, uh, and one of my clients connected us and it was fascinating because I, so I went through health issues. I was fully disabled for 12 years and bed bound for most of that from the age of 18 until 30. And I ended up healing on this old Russian diet that's all ketogenic soups. And, uh, and it was really a miraculous healing. And so then I went back to school for nutrition and opened up a private practice. Well, many years later, I met Brian Gaudet through one of my clients and we connected and he was the only person I had ever met who wasn't a client of mine who had healed through eating nothing but soup. So it, it was really kismet. And we just hit it off and became instant friends and he wanted me in his business initially he wanted me to do like 50 percent of his business but i have been swamped since i went into remission my business is just maxed out at all times so i was like i'll be your director i'll come up with your recipes i'll do promotional stuff for you i can't do 50 (laughs) percent i don't have the time but uh but anyway so that's how we started working together maybe three four years ago i'm not sure how long ago that was so what was the the condition that uh that you Well, now it's becoming more famous. It used to be very rare. It's called dysautonomia. Uh, Long COVID people, people with post Ebola are getting it. It's very common post a serious infection. I was in the Bahamas studying to be a marine biologist and 15 of the 30 of us had a foodborne infection that for me went into my brain and caused a nervous system disease. Uh, It stayed in there for three years causing havoc. And I ended up with very severe kidney disease, liver disease, thyroid, lung disease. Uh, and wasting. So I looked like a Holocaust victim, basically. And yeah, and my parents really threw everything at it. So they took me to the best of the best. They flew me to see uh, President Clinton's doctor at the time and all sorts of things. But I was just wasting away until year seven of the 12 years, my dad, who's a physicist, was like, this isn't working. All these medicines aren't working, this breathing machine, like, what are we doing? We need to look elsewhere. So we started reading and researching on our own. And we started trying things because no one, I was the first medical case to reverse it. And so there weren't any books on that, but there were books on reversing cancer and heart disease and depression. So we did all those methods and we, we tried them each for three to six months at a time. And I did maybe 16, 17 different diets until I stumbled on the Russian soup diet uh, that I did a unique version of because mine was very ketogenic. It was low oxalate and lectin and all those things. And, uh, and it put me into remission really quick it reversed my neuropathy and kidney disease and everything. So yeah, so a year, year and a half in, I was fully off of everything and uh, and back at school and honestly healthier than I was before I went into it. Well, that, that's just such an amazing story. I mean, um, and, and you know, that was a condition that was brought on by, by a bug, you know what I mean? As opposed to most of the people in, in this community are, are, have chronic diseases that, that are really a result of, of eating too many carbohydrates most of the time, you know, and, and that leads down the road to, the, to these chronic conditions. Yours wasn't brought on by, by a diet. It was brought on by, by an actual disease that you got, a bug that you got. So that's, it was, that's it was pretty amazing. Luck, I'll tell you, I do think the diet was partly responsible. So I come from a healthy family and I was healthy. I was training for Ironman healthy. I was training for Ironman at the time, but because I was an athlete, I really bought into the dietary dogma. So I really didn't eat any fats. I ate like turkey and raw carrots and rice cakes. And, uh, and because of that, with what I know now, really saturated fat is the food of the immune system. So I wasn't giving myself what it needed to fight off direction and coming from Ohio and going into a subtropical region that my microbiome's not used to, not surprising, but yeah, no, it was, it was more, I would have been healthy had that not happened. So it was, uh, it was from the infection, but there were things I could have done that would have made me more resilient. That's for sure. So, so I did a podcast interview with, with Brian and for those listening, you can go back and listen and listen to that. I mean, he had a fascinating story that we, you know, I mean, he was an air force well, marine pilot or whatever, chopper pilot, and had to stop flying because he was basically getting vertigo, you know? But you could see when you look at his pictures and that, he was definitely way, way overweight and stuff like that. You know, he was becoming, he was metabolically unhealthy. 
Um, and he reversed his condition and got flying again um, by using soups, as you mentioned. <clears throat> and this is only the second story that I've ever heard about that. Um, so I'm fascinated to hear about, like, you found this Russian diet. I mean, it, it obviously was, I didn't even know something like that existed. The first time I ever heard about someone doing something with soup was with Brian. Um, yeah. So so what do you think is is so unique about soup? What do you, because you said you tried so many other diets. So what yeah. do you think it was about this and soup in particular that that made the difference that now got you over that hump to towards starting I'll to reverse this? You know, I, I fell into that Russian diet after learning more about the microbiome. The microbiome has mostly been studied by the Russians. The Americans are so far behind. They're just really missing the mark on this whole eat variety to get a, a you know, broad spectrum microbiome. And really a lot of my work studying with tribes is to hope, hopefully to show that a diverse microbiome does not equal health. And uh, uh, microbiome with little diversity doesn't equal illness. Most of the tribes I visit have very little diversity and they're in perfect health, far better than we could ever be. It's more what's in there. And, uh, and anyway, so I got really nerdy into the microbiome. Uh, my whole family are in the sciences and so I had access to studies that other people didn't via, via their credentials. And, uh, and I started looking into it. And for me, you know, to answer it now, it seems like one thing that the diet did is it fully prevented any food that can feed bacterial overgrowth. So it would make a big difference between say eating a small bit of carrot versus eating a sweet potato. Sweet potato can feed bacteria and keep it alive. And with someone who's compromised, that's an issue. Sweet potato for someone who's healthy isn't an issue, but uh, for someone who's compromised, it's gonna feed the overgrowth, you're gonna get more sick. So it was very specific about the long chain polysaccharides and what, what amount of saccharides could be in the diet in order to not feed bacterial overgrowth and only feed the good bacteria so that you can start to stabilize. So it kind of uses the body for you instead of against you. And then further, it's really designed around rebuilding the gut lining. We have 70% of our nervous system in our gut lining and 80% of our immune system right there with one cell between it and our food. And so it's designed to be very soft and warm, just like you would feed a baby nothing harsh, nothing rough, not even something like kale chips, right? Nothing rough <laughs> on there so that you can start to regrow the villi. The gut lining should have these beautiful coral reef-like fingers in there. And this is where the good bacteria will live. But most people who are compromised, it's like a dystopian coral reef. And this is where the bacterial overgrowth live. And it's what changes whether or not a bacteria is good or bad. Same with a parasite. So like sure you hear a lot about H. pylori. <laughs> People are always killing it and doing all these things. Well, when it's on the tips of the villies, which is where it's supposed to be, it actually makes you healthier. But when it gets into this, this causes huge problems. So it's actually not the fact that it's there uh, or in the body. It's where it is in the body uh, more so. So it's not so much about killing it. So that's what the diet did. I, I honestly, I did it differently than Brian in that, uh, one, you don't do bone broth. You only do meat broth, which is much more gentle on the gut lining. And two, I ate literally the same thing, Doug, for every meal for two years. <laughs> it was the most boring thing I've ever done. <laughs> So, so it was just a boiled chicken with, um, with just about a quarter cup of carrot and onion and then a pile of ghee. The bulk of my calories came from the ghee and then I ate six cups of broth a day. And that was my diet for two years. I didn't change it because after the first month of being on that diet, I, I was far worse. I was having more like 10 seizures a day instead of three, which was more my normal with the illness. And uh, I had these monthly check-ins at Cleveland Bank where I would get and things. And I went up and they did the nerve testing. And at the end of the, the appointment, my wonderful neuromuscular doctor came back and he was like, I don't know what you're doing, but your nerves are growing. So keep doing it. <laughs> and so I stayed on it far longer than I would have. And then when I got into remission, one, it wasn't supposed to happen. I really was supposed to die. And so when I got there, I didn't want to mess with it, Doug. I was like, this is great. I'll eat this for the rest of my life if I have to. Yeah, <laughs> I'm very happy to stay be alive, here. So. For sure. 
Yes, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I have very fond memories of this the soup to this day, and uh, and I still I use soup with most of my clients. So I have these tons of protocols. I've got like sixty protocols for different conditions, and sometimes with the same condition I'll do ra like radically different protocols. But uh, I use soup a lot with a lot of them, and put them on something similar, especially if they're as severe as I was. You talked about a whole a boiled chicken. I'm assuming it, so instead of doing uh, the carcass, which is normally what we would use to make bone broth, um, mm -hmm. you, you boiled the entire chicken. Does that, is there, is there, did you then eat the meat that was in there as well? So I'm, I'm thinking that based on what you were telling me about the diet that you were doing is like, where did the protein come from? Was that from ah, the chicken, the chicken that was left in the soup or what? Yeah, it was the chicken. So I ate a whole chicken with the organ and then lots of the broth, which also has a lot of protein. And it is meat broth. You're not allowed to have bone broth in that diet. It, it The biochemical makeup is different. Bone broth is wonderful, but it can be rough with someone with a nervous system disease like I had. And then, uh, and then just very small amounts of carrot and onion. Those were my two vegetables and then enormous amounts of ghee. So my protein came from the broth and the chicken meat. Okay, and, and when you say chicken, did you did did you debone it? Because you saying you didn't. So the bones were in already, so, but because it was the whole chicken, that's not bone broth, right? So, or did you debone it and just put the chicken in? No, that's a great question. The thing that makes it bone broth versus meat broth or meat stock, whichever word you want to use, is the cooking time. So meat broth is under two and a half hours, but you can have bones in there. You can I used lots of chicken feet and all sorts of things in there, uh, and then bone broth is the twenty four hour. Okay, and then there's a, so much other stuff that leaches out of the out of the bones that over that period that's not happening in two and a half hours. That's right. It's more mineral rich in the okay. bone broth, which is wonderful for a healthy person. But a lot of times, what's so good for a healthy or moderately sick person is not healthy for someone who's very compromised, simply because it's rough. Right? Minerals are are abrasive on the gut lining. They're a bit like Velcro on a paper cut. If you don't have a paper cut, Velcro is fine, but if you've got a paper cut, it's very aggravating. So yes, yeah, so that's why it's not done in the beginning stages anyway. All right. So now you're saying you, you help people um, with a ton of different pro diets, protocols or whatever, depending on, on their situation, which is uh, music to my ears, I think in a way, because I think what's happening with this whole, especially since it's taken off and become flavor of the month, this keto thing, um, people have been so dogmatic about this is how it has to be. And, 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 it, and they lose sight of the fact that everybody is an individual and that ev everyone is different and that pe different people respond differently to different things. And um, it's, it's just, enlightening to see that there's someone that that actually recognizes that and says okay oh, who you. are you what are you what is your situation um and then based on that starts to try and find something that is that is ideal for for you um so that's that's awesome to hear um oh, thank you it's my favorite part and i think it was just a natural part of the journey because when i went in well first being from ohio where no one does diets I, I, I really realized like, you know, a lot of people are perfectly healthy on other foods that I can't tolerate. <laughs> and that, that's okay. But also when I went into remission soon after the second medical case of a dysautonomia patient going on record of reversal, it came out and she did a diet that I had tried before and wasn't successful with. And that fascinated me. And then the third case also did a radically different diet than I did. And so that always stayed in my mind. And that's part of what I'm doing with all this worldwide research, Doug. Honestly, it's mostly for my own interest to go to all these different tribes, but I take their blood sugar, I, take their tons, I do all that kind of stuff. But I love that no matter where I go, as long as they're eating their traditional diet, whether it's Messiah or Chaga, which are very different diets, they're in perfect health. Perfect. It's only once they start implementing uh, the influx of foods from other continents. So like whether it's nightshades, whether it's corn, whatever it is, because the processing method is lost. Super important. So as soon as they get non-ancestral, then they start to get the, the diseases of modern. Okay. 
So you're still working with clients. Um, mm -hmm. I, obviously, you're saying you need a good internet, so that so that's obviously how you do it. Um, yeah. Are you still taking clients? So because I'd love to tell people how to get hold of you and how to you know if they're looking for for help with this, that uh, sure. hopefully you'd be able to to help them. So. Sure. How, so, do they, how do they get hold of you? I just restructured because I was on a, an eight month wait list and I was like, this is ridiculous. So now I'm taking people in group format. So I did, um, I'm doing a long COVID dysautonomia and neuropathy group, which it, I am loving, where I can just onboard a bunch of people at once and work with them. And they actually do different protocols within there, but because all the lifestyle advice is the same, it works really well. And then, uh, and then I'm starting next week, a histamine group and a hormonal group. So that's for anyone who's like, infertile, has thyroid disease, anything to do with the hormones, adrenal issues, uh, testosterone issues, and all of that. And then I have a staff that I've trained and I work um, on Thursdays, I do a practitioner training. So I work with doctors, nutritionists, and train them in all the different diets and when to use them and when not to use them and that kind of thing. Okay. But you still haven't told us how to, how to get hold of you. Um, oh, that would be, yeah, on my website. <laughs> that's on my website. So on my website, you can sign up for those groups. And that's the best way. I'm not doing one-on-one, -on -one, but the groups are honestly better. I'm getting better success. Okay. So and the website is? Enableyourhealing.com. Enableyourhealing.com. And I'll put notes in there about that as well. It's been fascinating chatting to you. And um, I look forward to, I hope, hopefully you can get back out to the States, maybe to one of our events or something. And I'll get, to, I'll get to meet you in person. But um, thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for what you do and how many people that oh. you're helping. Because um, that's what, what we're all about. So thank you for being part of the solution, part of the community. Um, oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having this community. It's, it's so important. You know, when I was ill, no one knew what ketosis was. No one knew what low carb was. <laughs> it wasn't a thing outside of Atkins. We, you know, everyone just thought it was for weight loss. And now that we're seeing so many, just tens of thousands of people go into remission, it's really helpful to have communities like yours where there's a place for patients to help themselves uh, and empower themselves with all the knowledge you guys pump out. That's fascinating. Thank you very much again. And uh, hopefully we'll see you soon. Okay, that sounds great. Thank Thanks. you, Doug. You've been listening to an episode of the Low Carb USA podcast. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash lowcarbusa.